you are not in dark that the day should catch you off guard like a thief no all of you who believe in christ are children of light and of the day and belong not to the darkness nor to the night your light shines true in the still shadows that linger in the windows of the soul the eyes have it it always shows that that reveals you as friend or foe and here i stand letting you know standing still are you ready for the show well get ready cuz here we go hello americans i'm paul harvey and this is the testing time we are being tested you know you and i individually and collectively the test isn't going to be all fun or all easy but if you'll hear me out i think you'll agree you wouldn't want it any other way such a little while ago we sat around in our councils of men chewing our fingernails up past the elbow worrying about the hideous force which man had loosed on the world when he unharnessed the atom now looking back we can see that the nuclear weapon was a disguised blessing we're outnumbered by our potential enemies seven to one war with bayonets we couldn't win the big bomb was the equalizer which cut the limitless hordes of asia down to our size this awesome weapon stood between us and slavery and now we can see that an all-wise almighty entrusted this hideous instrument to our tiny fraction of the earth's population first not for our destruction but for our deliverance our problems are not new ones what are our problems death war and taxes well there's nothing new about the first of these nor about wars hot or cold wars never end Cain clobbered Abel with about a four pound club and men have been fighting ever since the only difference being that with each succeeding generation the foot pounds of destructive energy which one man can deliver increased through the development of the crossbow and catapult gunpowder and the automatic weapons and the cannon the airplane the bomb the blockbuster for thousands of years the line on the chart measuring the foot pounds of destructive energy which one man can wield goes up in a slow steady incline until august 1945 and suddenly the line on the graph shoots for the stratosphere for then it had been thrust into the hands of man a weapon 400 million times more lethal than anything ever before this has changed the complexion of war but wars never end in the Three and a half thousand years of recorded history, fewer than eight percent of those years have been warless ones, and even in this eight percent of the time between, the wars between the wars, which we have come to call Cold Wars, went on. Nor is there anything new about these. Quintus Fabius Maximus, the Roman general, was the original Cold War kid, I guess you could say. The Romans nicknamed him the Comptator, meaning one who delays. He marched and countermarched. He turned the battlefield into a parade ground, but he wouldn't fight. Hannibal's getting ulcers, but he isn't getting shot. And they say one day old Fabius met the Carthaginians on the field of battle, and he said dramatically, Well, what will it be, war or peace? And they said, but that time they were so bush, chasing him around didn't make much difference one way or the other. So he said, Then let it be war. And with a dramatic flourish, he flung his toga to the ground and ran as fast as he could in the opposite direction. Now, there's nothing new about wars, hot or cold. Cold wars are waged by the forces of espionage and counter-espionage. And history demonstrates that who wins this war between the wars generally determines who gets the drop on whom when somebody blows the whistle on a shooting match. Now, however, with the major world powers armed with weapons of annihilation, it is possible that for the first time in history, the cold war between the wars may be perpetuated. You see, when you and I were boys, we used to resolve our differences as boys with our fists. And generally, you or I would come home with a black eye or a bloody nose, but the difference was resolved. We don't do it that way anymore. Nowadays, though, we try to pretend to our wives that we have some nobler motive. The fact of the matter is that the only reason we don't fight with our fists anymore is that we are so increased in size and physical prowess, we've become so strong in the arms and so soft in the tummy that if we were to wage combat, somebody might get badly hurt. Maybe somebody might get killed. It just wouldn't be worth it. So now we resolve our differences by more moderate means. Americans, it's the judgment of most thinking men that the great nation-states of the world have now approached such a position of physical strength 
physical prowess, that none will dare to attack the other. If the initiation of the armed conflict is in itself a suicidal act, then a military standoff might conceivably be perpetuated and doomsday postponed indefinitely. This, however, presupposes that we're going to keep us strong. That's us spelled U.S. Strong in our arms and in our hearts. Now then, what makes a nation strong? Taxes? There's nothing new about those either. The first income tax was paid by Abraham. It was written on a rock by the hand of divinity and handed to Moses at the top of Mount Sinai. And you might want to remember this. It was at the flat rate of 10%. It promised the wrath of God on anybody who tampered with or violated that law. Christ was born in Bethlehem because Joseph was on his way to pay his taxes. Joseph was a relatively well-to-do landowner of the house and lineage of David. Yet the taxes exacted by Caesar Augustus were so exorbitant that he didn't have enough money left over to employ a trusted messenger for the mission, so though his wife was great with child, he made the journey himself. And Christ was born in Bethlehem because Joseph was on his way to pay his taxes. And Christ was born in a manger because there was a housing shortage when he got there. Our problems are not new. At Runnymede, the Magna Carta was handed to King John on the end of a sword, denying to royalty the right of unlimited taxation. Yet you know it was for us, the American people, to become the first in recorded history ever voluntarily to surrender our rights to private property. Oh, yes, we did with an innocent-sounding constitutional amendment, the 16th, which says that Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes on incomes from whatever source derived. And we forgot to put any limit on the extent to which we could tax ourselves. Conceivably, we could be taxed out of all private property. We could be taxed not 70%, 80%, 90%, but 100%. We could awaken one morning and find that the government owns the farm and the house and the car and has a mortgage on the church, legally. Historically, whenever any nation has taxed its people more than 25% of their national income, initiative was destroyed and that nation was headed for economic eclipse. Well, presently, the American people are being taxed 33% of their total income. History says we'll roll forward on momentum for a little while, but we'd better get some more gas in the tank pretty quick. You see, ours is not the first by George good government to arise on the world stage. There have been several. Rome, Spain, and Greece, and China, and each enjoyed about 150 years at its zenith. That's just about our time in the New World. And then each decayed away. Not one of them was ever destroyed by anybody else's marching legions. Each rotted away morally, socially, culturally, economically, simultaneously. You know, one of the most cruel paradoxes of history is this. Because each was a good government, it bore bountiful fruit. And when it bore bountiful fruit, the people got fat. And when they got fat, they got lazy. And when they got lazy, they began to want to absolve themselves of personal responsibility and turn over to government to do for them things which traditionally they had been doing for themselves. At first, there appears to be nothing wrong asking government to perform some extra service for you, but if you ask government for extra services, government, in order to perform its increasing function, has to get bigger, right? Bigger, right? And as government gets bigger, in order to support its increasing size, it has to what? Tax the individual more. So the individual gets littler. And to collect the increased taxes requires more tax collectors, so the government gets bigger in order to pay the additional tax collectors. It has to tax the individual more, so the government gets bigger and the individual gets littler. And the government gets bigger and the individual gets littler until the government is all-powerful. The individual is hardly anything at all. The government is all-powerful. The people are cattle. Now, some believe that the need is for a vigorous strong man to arise on the scene, to regulate and regiment the affairs of men. Yet history tells us there have been several such. Once upon a time, there was a nation great and powerful and good. She was suffering from the aftermath of war, from a depression. And then came upon the scene a leader, an idealist, self-confident, intolerant of criticism. Wisely, he limited his early activities to combating the financial depression. Nobody could argue with that. But in a while... He began to regulate business and establish new rules to govern commerce and finance. 
Some of them in diametrical disagreement with the God-made laws of supply and demand, but anybody who disagreed with those new rules was promptly fired. The new leader saw that under the old system of free enterprise, landlords prospered, so he levied new taxes to take away their profits and destroy what he called the monopoly of capital. To please laborers, he controlled prices. To win the favor of the farmers, he gave them loans and subsidies. The national debt mounted alarmingly. Whenever anybody tried to tell him that governments, even as people, can go broke when they spend beyond their incomes, he said they just didn't understand deficit finance. Well, what do you say? Did he build on rock or on sand? I say on sand. For you see, this was the story of Emperor Su Tung Po, who led China to its doom more than a thousand years ago. And I am as satisfied with all my heart that if Uncle Sam ever does get whipped, here too, it will have been an inside job. It was internal decay, it was not external attack that destroyed the Roman Empire. Starting about 146 B.C., internal conditions in Rome were characterized by a welter of class wars and conflicts, street brawls, corrupt governors, lack of personal integrity and moral responsibility. About 290 years after Christ, a Roman emperor named Diocletian took over. He really grabbed the bull by the horns. He took over in a period of turmoil and severe depression. The first thing Diocletian did was call in the gold and close the banks and raise the taxes. He reduced the power of the Senate, delegated its power to a lot of little government bureaus. Do you know they even had a Transportation Act back there prescribing the fee required to rent one laden ass per mile? And at today's rate of exchange, it would have amounted to about one-eighth cent per mile, which meant that in order to make a profit, a jackass would have to carry five passengers? That was simply beyond the capacity of the jackass. Diocletian put millions of people on the public payroll, but when this failed to do the job, the country was still in trouble. He asked more personal powers for himself. For a brief while, incidentally, they were standby powers, but then he used them all at once. He froze wages, he froze prices, he froze jobs, he stopped profits, he dictated to the farmer what he should plant, when and how he should sell it, and for how much, and he rationed food. And what happened? The labor market closed down. Incentive was gone. Farm life became dependent on bureaucratic red tape. Exorbitant taxes cost the farmer his land. He kept for himself only a small plot on which he might grow turnips for his family. He lost the rest of it to the state. And without food and with incentive gone, city life stagnated and declined. And Rome passed into what history has recorded as the Dark Ages, lasting a thousand years. Just by turning to the left, the world has gone in circles. A nation would evolve from a monarchy into an oligarchy, from oligarchy to dictatorship, from dictatorship to bureaucracy, from bureaucracy to pure democracy, where finally the people would cry out from the chaos and confusion of the streets, Oh, please, God, give us a king, and God would give them a king. And they'd have a monarchy again and start the whole silly cycle anew. Now, either we will profit from the errors of their ways, or it follows as the night, the day, our children are going to have to relive the Dark Ages all over again. We can perpetuate the military standoff. We can delay doomsday indefinitely. We can continue on the high road that's made our United States the powerhouse of the world. But again, it isn't going to be all fun. But then nothing worthwhile ever is. If we intend to stay strong enough to enforce peace, let us determine first the source of our strength. How come after thousands of years of experiment our new nation has come so far so fast? All this in less than 200 years. What is the secret of our success? Well, I think it had to do with a basic American's creed. Perhaps it never passed the pioneer's lips in this form, but if it had, I think he would have said something like this. I believe in my God, in my country, and in myself. I know that sounds like a trite, too simple thing to say, and yet it's a rare man today who will dare to stand up and say, I believe in my God, and my country, and in myself, and in that order. 
When the early American pioneer first turned his eyes toward the West, there were only Indian trails or traces, as they were called, for him to follow through the wilderness. Do you know today you can roller skate from Miami to Seattle? From San Diego to Plymouth Rock? In this little bitty instant, as historical time is measured, our 7% of the Earth's population has come to possess more than half of all the world's good things. How come? Well, sir, when that early pioneer turned his eyes toward the West, he didn't demand that somebody else look after him. He didn't demand a free education. He didn't demand a guaranteed rocking chair at eventide. He didn't demand that somebody else take care of him if he got ill or got old. There was an old-fashioned philosophy in those days that a man was supposed to provide for his own and for his own future. He didn't demand a maximum amount of money for a minimum amount of work. Nor did he expect pay for no work at all. Come to think of it, he didn't demand anything. That hard-handed pioneer just looked out there at the rolling plains, stretching away to the tall green mountains, and then lifted his eyes to the blue skies and said, Thank you, God. Now I can take it from here. Now that spirit isn't dead in our country. It's dormant. It's been discredited in some circles, driven underground, but it isn't dead. It's just that a few seasons ago, politicians baiting their hooks with free barbecue and trading a Ponzi promise for votes began telling us we don't want opportunity anymore. We want security. We don't want opportunity, they said. We want security. They said it so often we came to believe them. We wanted security. And they gave us chains, and we were secure. Suddenly, with our constitutional guarantees depleted, with our national character eroding away, with our tax laws penalizing those who dare to prosper, with workers concentrating on how little they can get by with instead of how much they can produce, suddenly we looked overhead one day to discover that the first tin moon in space was a Russian accomplishment, that free men dragging their feet had been outdistanced by slave workers dragging their chains. And we were sore afraid. But as with the nuclear bomb, perhaps this was a disguised blessing too. Maybe a dramatic accomplishment by this Cold War adversary was necessary to get us off our dead centers and back to work again. If we can revive in ourselves, then in our youth, Something of that basic American's creed, the horizon has never, ever been so limitless. For man stands now on the threshold of his highest adventure of all, his first faltering footsteps into space. Twenty years from today, half of the products you will be using in your everyday living aren't even in the dictionary yet. We've got it made. If we just keep on keeping on, We've got it made. And if we don't, we will follow those other great nation-states of history into the graveyard of ignominious oblivion. History promises only this for certain. We will get exactly what we deserve. You see, storms are part of the normal climate of life. I've not promised you a horizon of no work and all ease, all honey and no bees, because storms are a part of the normal climate of life. Sometimes the storm takes the shape of an economic catastrophe or a military holocaust or a prolonged drought or a terrifying flood. But storms are a part of the normal year-in, year-out climate of life. We sometimes think our generation has been especially discriminated against, but in every generation... Young folks have wondered whether they should pursue an education or take the easiest possible way, whether they should enter the professions or not. Young folks have wondered whether they should marry or no. Young marrieds have wondered whether they ought to bring babies into an era of regulation and regimentation. In every hour of history, there have been these questions, the same as we have today, because there have always been storms to, to test men. Americans, a paradise is being prepared somewhere. A perfect place, don't you see? We've got to prove here we deserve to be there. And if there were perpetual sunshine, there'd be no victory. So storms are a part of the necessary climate of life. This is the shakedown cruise. Here's where we separate the men from the boys. 
If you and I conceivably could roll out a plush carpet on which our youngsters could walk off into a problem-free future, don't you see it would not be to their best interests for us to do so? They deserve a crack at this test, too. Storms are a part of the normal climate of life. There's an election going on all the time. The Lord votes for you, the devil votes against you, and you cast the deciding vote. Americans, for some reason, are being especially tested because we have been so richly blessed with the bounteous good things which invite sloth. Storms are a part of the normal climate of life. But what happens to a rooster in a storm? He goes over in a corner of the hen house and gets soaking wet and shivers and shakes and develops... What is it, coccidiosis or pip or one of those things roosters gets and dies? But what happens to an eagle in a storm? He sees the dark clouds. He sees them coming. But did you know this? The eagle, when he sees the dark clouds out there on the horizon, takes off and lets the tremendous storm winds and the vanguard of the turbulence actually help buoy him aloft and help him? I mean, the winds, the storm winds themselves are lifting the eagle until finally he is soaring above the storm in the sunshine. That's the answer, American. Storms are a part of the normal climate of life. We've got to learn to ride them. If, however, you do not share my personal conviction concerning this testing time, I mean, if the gravy train running three sections and the factory whistles summoning three shifts are creating too much din for a still small voice to be heard, let us nonetheless, with the conscience of reasonable men, preserve and protect and defend this last great green and precious place on earth against all its enemies, foreign and domestic, so help us God. If only because so many people you never knew have broken their hearts to get it and to keep it for you. Once upon a time there was an old hermit in the hills of Tennessee always used to be able to answer any questions that the youngsters of the community would bring to his hillside cabin. He was a wise old man, but in every community there is one scalawag, one borderline delinquent, one of those always getting himself into trouble, always leading others astray, and there was one such in this community. And one day he gathered his cohorts about him. He says, fellas, I have an idea how we're going to fox that old man up on the mountain. He thinks he's so smart. I'm going to catch me a bird, and I'm going to hold it in my cupped hands. And I'm going up to his cabin, and I'll say, what have I here, old man? He'll guess right. He always does. He'll say it's a bird. But then I'm going to say, is it alive or is it dead? If he says it's dead, I'll let it fly away and prove him wrong. If he says it's alive, before I show it to him, I'll crush it to death. Well, youngsters caught a small bird and went up to the hillside cabin, rapped on the door. The old man came to the door. The lad said, What have I here, old man? The old hermit said, Why, it appears to me it's a bird you've caught there, boy. And the lad, glancing at his friends out of the corners of his flashing eyes, said, Yes, but is it alive or is it dead? And the wise old man of the mountain said, It is as you will, my son. That is the sum of it, Americans. We have here captured the elusive eagle of individual liberty. Now you can love it and feed it and watch it fly or neglect it and starve it and it'll die. It is as you will. Mm -hmm. The future is in your hands. <laughs>